David Haskell, so nice to have you here with Thank us. You. And we've had a terrific exchange of not just ideas, but minds, body, spirits, I think, around this topic of what is a living earth? And while that's been alive for indigenous peoples for millennia, we're beginning to come back into resonance with that. Well, what does the term living earth mean for you? I guess I would start with my body, my own experiences. That, you know, living this hand is living earth in a way, one, one little node of, of living earth. The, of course, the cells that I can see, but also the bacteria that live on and, and around the, the hand. The, the five digits that reflect my kinship with other land vertebrates. That's a story that's about 600 million years old, perhaps. The opposable thumb, I, I share that with our kin, the old world monkeys and the great apes. So that's 35 million year old kinship and, and story. So in contemplation of, of the human body, human physiology, I would say also the human mind and our social networks, we see one manifestation of, of living a community that is about interrelationship and kinship in, in, a, in a, a very uh, physical, biological, chemical, chemical way. And that's then if we draw the, the, the concentric circles outwards, what I ate for breakfast this morning, other members of the Living Earth community in whose death I receive life. And then in my exhale, I then give life to other creatures. So thinking about my relations to creatures that seem to be others, I'm in community with them as well. Yeah. And you know, for years, I've been, I've been sitting, studying forests and, and trees in various ways. And of course, a forest and a tree is this lesson of the hand, but magnified a thousand, a thousand, a thousand times fold, because there the living earth community is much more complex, uh, much more uh, richly layered, much deeper stories and so on. My hand is actually part of that story, but it's one small part. So I see living earth meaning community, a dynamic relationship in, in a living network at multiple, multiple levels. And I'm part of that, but just one part of that. And through my work, I try to perceive and reach out into, into other parts. Yeah. So you've done remarkable work as a scientist and certainly as a writer. And it seems as though what's joining this, among many things, is contemplation or being present Give us a feel for how that happens with you. Yes. So, so um, in contemplative practice, one comes to a particular place or, um, or process with a commitment to return again and again in, in, in stillness, in silence, and be open to what might then unfold. And what that means in very practical terms is, for example, when I'm writing about trees, I will form a friendship, if you like, with a particular tree and commit to return over and over again over years, hundreds of times, to sit with this particular tree and, and listen, li literally listen to the, to the acoustic manifestations of its physiology, its ecology, its evolutionary history, and then listen in other ways, talking to people whose lives are connected, deeply connected with the tree, listen to words in the scientific literature, people who've studied the, this particular species or ecosystem, to understand those and in stillness to, to receive all these different strands of, of, of knowledge and understanding and relationship. And then as a writer to try to, to wrap some of those strands together in a way that then falls back out into the human community and says, hey, here's what I experienced with an olive tree at the gates of the old city of Jerusalem. Here's how this is relevant to our time now. Look at the conflict, for example, over, over land and trees uh, and, and water in that region. But a discussion informed by the scientific study, the archaeological study of what olive trees have meant in that place over thousands of years. Which then, and I don't do a lot of prognostication, but helps us discern perhaps fruitful pathways, in this case, literally fruitful pathways into the future. Uh, and so contemplative practice is a, is a way, first, of, of listening. Second, perhaps, of integrating. 
stories, and then a, a place to, to, to stand and to then share with, with others. So there's an intaking, a process of, of reflection, and then an, an, uh, a movement back out. Mm -hmm. It's such an extraordinary art. And what you've done in both of these <clears throat> remarkable books, um, The Forest Within and The Song of Trees, um, is, is stunning. And as you say, it invites us into both our present moment, historical time, mm -hmm. and geological time. In the sense that we're part of such a depth is stunning. You've also spoken um, about the period that we're living in as painful and how something of aesthetics mingled with ethics can help mitigate that pain, perhaps. But I'd love to hear your reflection. Yes, and this is, I mean, this is an experience that we all have when we're attentive to a particular place or to a particular person or set of relationships, we open to the extraordinary beauty of, of, of life, of the living community. And also we start to perceive some of the many layers of pain and fracture and brokenness, of injustice, of, of physical pain in, in the world. Of, and now in this time of diminishment and fracture, throughout the, the ecological community and the community, the, the human part of that ecological community, any process of listening will hear and, and uh, the, the, the pain will become just very, very extraordinarily real. But simultaneously, the beauty is still there. And so, so you have this, this paradox, if you like, that the, the world seems fundamentally broken and fundamentally beautiful. And contemplative practice gives us a place to sit with those paradoxes and those tensions to 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 hear them to feel them perhaps to figure out how to to act within within them uh, i think opening to to that beauty and to the pain is essential if we're going to make wise decisions about how to live in the world mm -hmm. so and, and that's the ethical dimension how shall we live how shall we respond to what we've perceived as, as individuals, but particularly as, as a group of people in conversation. Because, of course, what I perceive is just one tiny, tiny little portion of, of, of the reality. Mm -hmm. What you perceive will be slightly different to somebody else. And so this is why conversation, uh, contemplative listening is so important, that we can hear what all of us are saying. And by us, I mean all members of the human community, but also what are, what are the trees saying? They're not speaking in the way that I speak, We're mediated by a nervous system, but in their physiology, their DNA, their ecological relationships, there is thought, there is memory, there is understanding. And, and we, can, we can hear that through scientific process, through contemplative process, through artistic exploration and, and creation, all these different modes of knowledge and curiosity help us then understand where we are and how we might move forward in a way that is, uh, that is right, that is good and beautiful. And I think the good and the beautiful are closely aligned when our sense of beauty is, is a deep one. It's based on deep experience rather than a shallow, superficial, very uh, quick impression of, of, you know, the attractiveness of one particular ecosystem or arrangement uh, compared to another. And there's nothing wrong with some of that superficial, delightful uh, beauty in the world, but a deeper beauty that comes from decades of experience in a particular place can be a spot in which we can make ethical judgments where we can discern uh, right paths forward. forward. I love that. David, thank you for your writing. Thank you. For your work, you, your contemplation, and especially your work with students. Oh, thank, thank you. you.